Um, it is my very great honor and joy to introduce our speakers today, Filippo Contesi from the University of Barcelona. The title of his talk is Philosophy is Linguistic Rat. And Filippo is, is an extremely humble person, so I hope um, you don't mind like a minute giving you his short bio. Filippo Contesi is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Barcelona and a senior member of the Locos Research Group and the Barcelona Institute of Analytic Philosophy. He's published and forthcoming work in aesthetics, linguistic justice, the philosophy of effects, such venues such as analysis, the British Journal of Aesthetics, the European Journal of Philosophy, Metaphilosophy, Lewis Palgrave, Bloomsbury, Rutledge, and Oxford University Press. In addition, you probably know Contessi as the founding director of the Minorities and Philosophy Map, the UK network, launched the Barcelona Principles for a Globally Inclusive Philosophy Manifesto, and was first author of the Online Accessibility Pledge. Filippo, the floor is very much yours. Thank you so much, Yael. Um, you're extremely kind. Um, and thank you to um, the Linguistic Justice Society for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, this work, which <clears throat> um, is um, something I've been thinking about um, recently in a number of um, forms. And it's sort of, um, so it's linguistic justice um, topics for sure, um, especially inter uh, linguistic, linguistic justice, some, some people um, call it that. And, um, but also it sort of touches on uh, metaphilosophical issues, um, such as what makes a good um, philosophical contribution, what's the role of um, language and um, native languages in, uh, in philosophical contributions. Um, I'll be mostly talking about the analytic philosophy tradition, which is which is the one I work I work in, um, but also uh, I think the tradition that can be called uh, the mainstream uh, tradition in um, in the world. And um, but also I I see this as a sort of um, um, initial step or maybe a sort of a a, a step in a, in a topic that it's um, non not particularly well discussed, uh, which is, you could call it the aesthetics of uh, analytic philosophy. I have a background uh, mostly in uh, aesthetics and philosophy of affects. So part of the reason why I'm interested in uh, these topics, besides, as I said, the linguistic justice and metaphilosophy issues um, is also about the the kind of yeah, what we could call the aesthetics of analytic uh, philosophy, which is something that is, I guess, maybe not under this name, but it's um, perhaps starting to be um, studied a bit more than than in the past. I was, for instance, recently at a conference in a good, nice conference in uh, Canterbury at the University of Kent on philosophical style, and I could see that lots of people there um, were interested in. Uh, the way, the stylistic ways in which uh, we do philosophy in uh, roughly the analytic philosophy tradition today. And um, <clears throat> and I should say that um, throughout the talk, uh, I won't be, uh, I will be talking about different concepts that uh, at a more fine-grained analysis might need to come apart. But at this point, sort of of a I take to be preliminary analysis in in the sense of what um, I'm saying could be called the aesthetics of analytic philosophy, I take to be uh, pretty much synonymous. So I'll be talking about style, form, appearance as um, more or less synonymous. And of course, the uh, other side, uh, the, the opposites, if you will, content, substance, reality, also as uh, synonymous. And so the role of language has for a while been seen as important in philosophical investigations. Indeed, it is traditionally seen as central 
in the philosophical tradition that is the most likely candidate as the current mainstream philosophical tradition, namely analytic philosophy. Analytic philosophers in particular, those associated with the linguistic term, have often seen in language the key to understanding the world philosophically. However, the overt emphasis on language in analytic philosophy has in more recent decades diminished. In fact, much analytic philosophy published in influential journals today is not philosophy of language, but say philosophy of mind, epistemology, ethics, metaphysics, etc. Indeed, analytic philosophy is ever more embracing topics it was originally furthest from, such as analytic phenomenology or phenomenology, analytic idealism, analytic philosophy of religion, etc. Moreover, the methods employed by contemporary analytic philosophers don't necessarily conform to 20th century stereotypes of logical or ordinary language analysis. In fact, they're quite far from in many cases, perhaps most cases. Nonetheless, I want to argue in this talk that the emphasis on language is still more covertly crucial in establishing what the idea of philosophical contribution looks like, and hence at least in influencing which papers are published in the most influential analytic or mainstream philosophy journals. It does so by giving excessive value to those contributions, both oral and written, that are styled in such a way as to signal the virtues of clarity, precision and rigor that are often associated with the analytic tradition. And I think this emphasis on a particular type of linguistic style in a particular language, i.e. English, must be reduced to avoid that the so-called linguistic turn in philosophy turn into a linguistic rut. So I'll be uh, mostly doing two things in this talk. So one is uh, present a number of empirical uh, reasons, uh, numbers, mostly, uh, to think that non-native speakers of English are systematically marginalized in contemporary mainstream or analytic philosophy. Then I'll be briefly talking about uh, what we can do with that, uh, it's mostly just briefly talking about the Barcelona principles and, the, and their status at the moment. But then, um, the the other big part will be trying and understanding what uh, the reason behind this marginalization might be. Uh, so, and I'll be arguing, um, as I've already um, hinted at, that um, an excessive emphasis on um, style and on what I'll call the appearances of clarity, precision, and rigor plays in uh, analytic philosophy. So, I think that is something to avoid. And that also is what best accounts um, to for the marginalization of non-native speakers of English and contemporary philosophy. So for present purposes, I'll assume a view that identifies the analytic philosophy tradition as the currently closest form to the ideal of philosophy. And indeed, as I said, analytic philosophy is arguably the mainstream philosophical tradition in the world today. And as I understand it, analytic philosophy ultimately finds its roots in the ancient Socratic tradition. Such a tradition has typically been cosmopolitan, at least in spirit, was modified along the way by a rich influx of different traditions of thought originating in numerous parts of the world. One of the most celebrated early texts of this tradition, Plato's Apology, Socrates makes an indirect reference to the cosmopolitanism of philosophy when he introduces the defense speech he gives in his trial before the Athenians. I'll qu quickly quote from the Apology. So, so Socrates says, quote, I'm more than 70 years of age, and this is the first time that I've ever appeared in a court of law, and I am quite a stranger to the ways of the place. And therefore, I would have you regard me as if I were really a stranger whom you would excuse if he spoke in his native tongue and after the fashion of his country. That I think is not an unfair request. Never mind the manner 
which may or may not be good, but think only of the justice of my cause and give heed to that. Let the judge decide justly and the speaker speak truly." End quote. Here Socrates urges his fellow Athenians to disregard the linguistic form or style of his speaking and focus instead on whether what he says is true or not. Socrates' plea comes at the end of a paragraph in which he has condemned the eloquence of his accusers as a mere rhetorical trick. And indeed, Socrates' condemnation here is reminiscent of the way in which, in so many other Socratic dialogues, Plato would have Socrates criticize the sophists for their putting mere eloquence and rhetorical polish in the service of whatever cause, regardless of its truthfulness. The contest between Socrates and the sophists is but an early model of a problem that has repeatedly presented itself in philosophy ever since. Many points in the history of philosophy, charges have been raised against some philosopher or school of philosophy for the use of philosophical expertise as a mere lawyerly trick to support any cause regardless of its merits. Indeed, that has sometimes coincided with revolutions and changes of mainstream in philosophical thought. And around the beginning of the 20th century, I take it, one such revolution, led mainly by German and English-speaking philosophers, uh, broke to the rise of analytic philosophy. And so one um, sort of recent um, instance of uh, this Socratic uh, influence in uh, analytic philosophy is I take from um, uh, sort of a, a statement that Peter Lamarck is a uh, well noted, um, well, well known uh, analytic philosopher, uh, statistician, in fact, today, um, a statement that he makes in his paper, Poetry and Abstract Thought, where he discusses the distinction between form and content. And he argues that uh, form and content are in some sense indivisible, should in his sense, it should, they should be considered together in evaluating the um, aesthetic value uh, or the artistic value of a poem. On the co on, in, in contrast, he, he adds, philosophy is, is not like that, right? So form and content in philosophy are not inseparable. And indeed he says, quote, in philosophy, a conclusion is derived through principles of reasoning Logic, not rhetoric, dictates whether the conclusion has adequate support. There could not be a serious philosophical thesis that could only be expressed in one way or indeed an argument that demanded unique phrasing, end quote, right? So I take this to be what many, perhaps most uh, analytic philosophers, or mainstream philosophers think uh, today of the relationship between what I'm calling form or style and and content, and um, and the the next bit is to see if um, uh, it this is actually um, held out in reality, uh, in uh, in addition to the sort of the the sort of public statements or the public perception of analytic philosophy. So let's see what the status of non-native speakers of English in uh, philosophy is now. So it starts with some numbers. So even though only 6% of the world's population lives in majority Anglophone country, the most prominent circles within contemporary philosophy are almost exclusively centered around philosophers, journals, and university departments that are native speakers of English and based in Anglophone countries. For instance, the most influential ranking graduate programs in philosophy graduate programs in philosophy, the Philosophical Gourmet Report, PGR, only ranks institutions based in majority Anglophone countries. Indeed, the PGR ranking is based on reputational surveys of philosophers that are overwhelmingly native Anglophone and employed in Anglophone countries. So for instance, Brian Leiter and his colleagues um, that edit this um, the PGR, in the latest edition, they say, Quote, this year's overall rankings are based on reputational surveys completed by 174 
philosophers throughout the English-speaking world and continental Europe. 220 philosophers participated in either the overall or specialty rankings, often both, end quote. So specialty rankings are just rankings of philosophical subdisciplines such as aesthetics or philosophy of mind and so on. Okay, but then one goes and looks at the list that um, Leiter et al. Uh, put um, on their um, ranking. Ranking is basically a, a, a website uh, edited by Blackwell, but it's it's a website essentially. And um, one looks at the at the list of these two hundred and twenty philosophers who participated in either the overall specialty rankings of philosophy department. One finds that only seven of these 220 philosophers, which is about 3%, are based in uh, non-Anglophone countries, primarily based in non-Anglophone countries, right? This is, this is according to their own um, um, affiliation on, on the PGR ranking. So only 3% are based in an Anglophone country, which means 97% of the people who um, rank the uh, produce or you know, give evaluation for the most influential ranking of mainstream philosophy in the world are based in Anglophone countries and affiliate, primarily affiliated with an Anglophone country institution. And then similarly, the very influential lighter reports rankings of journals and publishing houses in philosophy also tend um, almost exclusively to list publication venues that are based in Anglophone countries. Moreover, only 7% of the 200 most cited contemporary authors in the most prestigious Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which I take to be the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, are or were non-native Anglophone or non-Anglophones altogether. In addition, non-native English speakers authored only about 5% of the 500 papers and books that were most cited by articles published between 1993 and 2013 in the four most prestigious Anglophone analytic philosophy journals. According to Schittgebel et al.'s um, 2018 survey of recent journal issues, this is published in um, a special issue of philosophical papers that I co-edited with Enrico Terrone um, in 2018, as I said. So according to, to Schwitz Weber et al.'s survey, only 3% of the sources cited by 12 elite analytic philosophy journals were originally written in a language other than English. And this is in sharp contrast to philosophical literature published in prestigious non-Anglophone journals which features a much more linguistically diverse range of citations. So for instance, between 20 and 51% of sources were originally written in the same language of publication in non-Anglophone journals of philosophy. And then 30 to 44% uh, of uh, the sources were originally written in English and then the remaining in another language, in a third language. Now moving on to the composition of the editorial boards of elite philosophy journals, according again to uh, Schwitzgebel et al's 2018 data, 96% of editorial board members of 15 top philosophy journals were primarily affiliated to an institution based in an Anglophone country. However, since Schwitzgebel et al did not provide finer grained analysis of that data, especially in terms of non-native speakers, which is a much more typically um, more time-consuming um, sort of data to collect than uh, affiliation uh, with an Anglophone or an Anglophone country. So since Chief Gable did not provide that kind of finer grain data, I conducted additional analysis on their data sets. And my results show that non-native English speakers make up less than 11% of the editorial board members of those 15 journals. However, notably, this percentage includes also data about Synthes, which was at the time ranked 15 among top philosophy journals. On Schwitzgebel et al's data sets, Synthes had by far the biggest percentage of non-native Anglophone editorial board members, 61%, and the lowest percentage of Anglophone country affiliated members, 58%. And on that top 15 
list journal ranking. Indeed, Synthes was the only journal to be mostly edited outside of an Anglophone country. So if one excludes Synthes, the percentage of non-native Anglophone editorial board members of those 15 journals, and now 14, drops from 11% to 8%. And correspondingly, the percentage of Anglophone country affiliated board members goes up from 96 to 98%. And then finally, restricting the analysis to the top 10 journals on that same ranking, the percentage of editorial board members working primarily in Anglophone countries stays in 98%, while the percentage of non-native Anglophones further diminishes uh, to 7%. Okay, so now I'm wary that um, time is running out. So I'm... Um, um, you have you have easily 20 more minutes 20 more minutes yeah so i'm just going to i'm just going to yeah talk about this um other bit of numbers so in addition to ranking citation editorial board data publishing data also confirms the overwhelming prevalence of native anglophone philosophers at the top of the discipline according to yen and hung's recent survey of 18 prestigious philosophy journals native anglophone scholars made up about 69% of all published authors and Anglophone country affiliation tracked native Anglophone status closely with 73% of authors being affiliated with at least one Anglophone country institution. Now those percentages don't look as bad as the previous ones, but they become more striking if one considers the selection of journals that were included in this Yen and Hung 2019 survey was not based only on prestige, but also in order to cover different geographical regions and philosophical subdisciplines. In large part, the list of the 18 selected journals was intentionally based on Leiter's 2015 journal rankings. However, there were significant exceptions. For instance, six of the 10 journalist journals included in the survey were among Leiter's 2015 top 10 journals. And among the four remaining journalist journals selected, there are also the only two non-Anglophone country-based top 20 journals included in that edition of Leiter's journal rankings, again, Synthes and Erkentness, as well as another Leiter reports top 20 journal with an explicitly declared interest in linguistic diversity, which is the European Journal of Philosophy. And Synthes and Erkentness had the lowest percentage of native Anglophone authors among all 10 journals, journals included in the survey, immediately followed by the European Journal of Philosophy. So in addition to confirming the dominance of native Anglophone scholars in contemporary philosophy, these data suggest at least one additional point, which is that the combination of the data presented about the journal synthesis and their Kentness for respectively editorial board composition and publication data shows a positive correlation between the percentages of non-native Anglophone scholars on those journals editorial boards and the percentages of non-native Anglophone scholars who publish in those journals. In other words, native language of the editors, perhaps not surprisingly, appears to influence the native language of published authors. <clears throat> so what to do about about this, so I think uh, uh, a solution to the uh, current linguistically exclusive situation in philosophy is to increase the linguistic and then accordingly cultural and geographic diversity of contemporary philosophy substantially, in part by the directly increasing the diversity of linguistic background in philosophy. Um, and as a first step towards implementing such a solution in 2021, I formulated as Yael um, reminded um, the Barcelona principle of global inclusive philosophy, uh, which were fairly successful at, uh, at the individual level. So about 750 philosophers uh, throughout the world signed from about over, actually over 35 countries, I think. But, um, um, the next step was to um, try and sign up uh, institutions, so instead of individual philosophers. And that has been going a bit more uh, difficult, has uh, been more difficult, right? So we have about 26 or so institutions uh, who have signed, 
but uh, these institutions are either uh, philosophy of science institutions, so all of the major um, European, um, uh, American, British, analytic philosophy of science, history and philosophy of science, um, societies and journals have signed, um, and then a few societies outside the Anglophone uh, uh, world. But um, the, the number of sort of prestigious top institutions is, is still limited. The, the Aristotelian Society has signed, the uh, Australasian Journal of Philosophy has signed, Ergo has signed. But um, um, there's still room for improvement, let's say, right? So, and and um, and I always welcome any any help. But more interestingly for today is what is the reason uh, uh, for this uh, lack or, or this marginalization, I would say, of um, uh, uh, non-native Anglophone uh, philosophers. So this could be one, maybe it's quality of training in method, right? So it could be argued that, well, you know, these are um, the, the Anglophone country institutions are uh, the best um, places to learn how to do analytic philosophy. So, of course, it's not surprising that there will be a concentration of um, uh, top or, you know, people who are considered um, top analytic philosophers coming from uh, these institutions and working at these institutions. Well, the problem with this is, isn't it obvious what the method of analytic philosophy is supposed to be now? I mean, maybe sort of at the beginning, uh, people thought, at least were convinced there was a particular method based on the analysis of language um, and, you know, helped by uh, the logical tools that were, had been recently discovered by Frege and others. And, um, to the extent to which that was actually ever um, a single clear um, uh, actually used method is, is debated. But, you know, even assuming that there was a method at the beginning of analytic philosophy now, over 100 years after um, its inception, it, it's, it's just not clear to me, as I've said, that there's anything like an analytic method that makes, um, that is common to a lot of analytic uh, philosophy now. So then if there is no particular method, then it's just doing good philosophy and, you know, millennia of uh, of philosophy, at least two millennia of philosophy show that the concentration of philosophical talent um, uh, has been very widespread. It's definitely not um, 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 sort of narrowly based in, in Anglophone uh, countries, right? The other possibility could be, well, it's where the prestigious institutions are based, right? And then, so Aaron Preston in, in a book on, in 2007, for instance, has this view that analytic philosophy exists only as a social group rather than a philosophical group, right? So this is just the idea that, well, it's just a, a human enterprise and there's uh, people uh, co-opting other people in, you know, as, as it often um, happens in academia. Um, and there's just nothing more to it, right? So also Ellen de Cruz recently has talked about um, what she calls a prestige bias in philosophy. Um, and I have some sympathy with, with the kind of argument that Ellen de Cruz uh, puts forward, though I, I don't think prestige bias is the right name for her argument. I would rather call, talk about pedigree bias because it's, it's an issue of, sort of hiring people who have gone to a certain number of institutions uh, uh, to get their uh, undergraduate and graduate training. But in other case, in, in other case uh, you know, call it prestige, call it pedigree. Uh, there's, as I said, there's definitely a, lo a lot of truth to it, but can be the only reason because, so for instance, mo movement now uh, between countries and institutions at the postdoctoral level or at the graduate student level is quite high, 
right? The problem is that when it gets to permanent uh, appointments, people tend to get hired in their tend to go back to their own countries uh, or at least their region uh, of provenance uh, outside of the Anglophone world, even though they've had extensive um, experience uh, and, and, and education in many cases in the Anglophone world. Um, and then also it's just given, for instance, a bunch of factors such as uh, the prevalence of anonymous uh, review in philosophy journals, or at least sort of at least in in um, in principle on the face of it. Um, that these these factors make it difficult uh, to think that there's only a sort of a you know a friends of friends mechanism. Uh, going on right so brutally like that right so I think there's there's a bit more than than just um, this idea Preston's idea that analytic philosophy is a social group rather than a philosophical group the other possibility could be well um, it's just the quantity of philosophers right so so obviously analytic philosophy was for a long time um, practiced almost exclusively in Anglophone countries for various historical reasons, which um, most of you probably know, and I, anyway, I don't have time to go into. So one might think, well, you know, it's still, there's still a lot of philosophers there, so maybe it's just this overwhelming number of people in top journals and top institutions, it's just a matter of just the, the offer, right? There's so many more philosophers uh, in the Amazon world. Um, now I don't have I don't have data on this. I I'm open to being proven wrong, but my sense is that you know there's lots of departments in non-anglophone countries or, or research centers in non-anglophone country in non-anglophone countries which do analytic philosophy. Uh, European societies or or non-anglophone country societies of analytic philosophy have been uh, around for over thirty years. So I'm not sure that is the reason. Also, the data uh, that I provided about Synthes and Erkentnis, so the positive correlation between uh, the number of non-native Anglophone uh, philosophers in editorial boards and the number of non-native Anglophone philosophers getting published in those journals seems to suggest that it's not just a matter of um, uh, numbers of people submitting papers, right? But th there's there's more going on. So my suggestion is that uh, style or form or appearances are what uh, is driving this. Um, and so analytic philosophy is, as I said, historically tied to the, to the linguistic turn, which is an increased attention given to language as a central key to understanding the world philosophically. And now, however, among contemporary philosophers, philosophy of language no longer has the centrality it used to have. And yet, linguistic considerations, in my view, continue to be very important in our practice. And one way in which this importance manifests itself is in the attention that contemporary philosophers give to the way in which they write or speak. Right? So if you're giving a talk, but I think uh, it's especially um, important in the way one writes. Consider, for instance, the following assessments of the style of contemporary philosophy. So in a recent piece, a philosopher uh, at the University of York, I think in Canada, York University, Regina Rini says, quote, philosophers are people who write under extreme stylistic constraints, meant to satisfy journal referees' vague and empowered sense of what looks like a work of philosophy, end quote. And then another analytic philosopher, and Sophie Barwich in 2020 says uh, in an interview, quote, Academic philosophy too often is an exercise of form over the creation of content, end quote. By academic philosophy means current academic mainstream philosophy. Finally, philosopher Kostika Bradatan observes that, quote, as journal editors receive fresh submissions, the first thing they do is scan them for external markers of conformity to the group's internal rules and orthodoxy, specific terminology, references to the group's authorities, favorite themes and topics, and even certain terms of phrase and rhetorical tropes, end quote, right? So here I should add that, you know, in addition to, I think, what I take to be a, um, a, a, a heritage of, a corrupt heritage of um, the analytic, the early analytic philosophers 
uh, interest in language. There's also more um, sociological, technical reasons uh, for uh, this attention to style, which were um, hinted at in this quote by Brother Tan. So, uh, you know, the existence, the, the, the main functioning of philosophy by pre-publication peer review, uh, very low acceptance rates at uh, philosophy, extremely low acceptance rates of philosophy journals as compared to um, journals in many other disciplines. Uh, and, and also just the fact that uh, contrary to many of the sciences, the, the, the philosophy journals are still run by academics who have to do their own sort of teaching and, you know, but sometimes maybe they get some relief from teaching, but they still have to publish and do admin work and, and then on top of that, edit journals, right? So the so the the amount of um, of work that these uh, uh, editors of journals, for example, have to do is is so big that um, some sort of high high profile uh, editors of journals have publicly admitted that they very quickly skim read um, papers before making an initial um, decision. And of course, such an attention to stylistic considerations is not unique to contemporary philosophy. Philosophy in other periods and traditions has also displayed a special emphasis on language and linguistic presentation. At the same time, however, the kind of style that is prized in contemporary philosophy is influenced by the particular features that are associated with the analytic revolution, and in particular, with its emulation of mathematical or scientific reasoning. And such an emulation is sometimes referred to as an emphasis on the properties of clarity, precision, and rigor. Such an emphasis on clarity, precision, and rigor has indeed very often been touted as a central good-making feature of the analytic approach. Indeed, it can be argued that such an emphasis was an important cause of the success of the approach and of its current dominance. Nevertheless, as some critics from within the analytic tradition have argued for, for a bit, the emulation of scientific reasoning practiced by contemporary analytic philosophers doesn't really conform to actual scientific practices, nor does it actually lead to achieving the intended virtues of clarity, precision, and rigor in many cases. Indeed, the, evolution, the emulation of the sciences as it's practiced by many contemporary philosophers, too often in the words of, for instance, Giancarlo Rota, uh, who wrote in the 1990s, uh, important Italian-American philosopher and mathematician, the emulation of the sciences, uh, as it's practiced by many contemporary philosophers, too often appears to parrot, in Rota's word, uh, the language and methods of the sciences, merely parrot them. And more generally, the pursuit of virtues such as scientific rigor by analytic philosophers has, I think, over time become more and more the pursuit of the appearance of those virtues. Right? So style is now too often used as a signal of clarity, precision, and, and rigor. But in addition to its being generally bad for philosophical quality, the current privileging of these particular styles of appearances or appearances is especially hard on non-native Anglophone philosophers. Firstly, success in philosophy will depend on one's qualities as a writer or as a speaker, rather than as a philosopher. Consequently, the better grasp and experience one has with a particular language, the more likely it is that one will make it in the academic philosophy echelon. Since the lingua franca of philosophy is English, non-native Anglophone prospective philosophers have a huge structural barrier to overcome. Moreover, the present situation will exclude valuable contributions offered by philosophers who are not in the know about the particular style that is prized at a particular time. Such stylistic preferences, in fact, are by no means completely obvious to all. Like the sciences, for instance, where there are long-standing widespread practices of, for instance, subdividing a contribution into predetermined sections, say introduction, methods, results, discussion. Philosophy remains, in principle, a fluid discipline stylistically, and thus the contributions that are excluded will tend to come from authors who are outside the philosophical circles that are at that time considered most prestigious which typically run the most prestigious journals. And such circles are, as I have said, and have been for decades, centered around philosophers' journals and university departments that currently figure most prominently in influential rankings and collections such as the PGR and the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. As we've seen, 
An overwhelming majority of those people and institutions are native English speakers and are based in Anglophone countries. Moreover, the data also suggest the existence of strong relationships between those people and institutions. Not only do prominent philosophers tend to spend or have spent, or have spent most of their academic careers in prominent university and departments in Anglophone countries, they also, as data from Schwitz Gable uh, and Ellen de Cruz shows, they also tend to have been educated at both graduate and undergraduate level in elite institutions in Anglophone countries. And since higher education systems are still in large part continues with lower level education systems at the national level, right? So one tends to do primary school, high school, university, and so on in, in the country where one uh, grew up. That means that the vast majority of such philosophers continue to be native Anglophones. In addition to considerations of injustice, the resulting waste of philosophical talent is bad because philosophical talent is, uh, at least prima facie, unlikely to be concentrated in one set of countries or a single language. And furthermore, lack of linguistic diversity impedes the competition of ideas coming from different linguistic and cultural backgrounds. Indeed, the very attention to language that is proper to analytic philosophy is at odds with its general neglect of the philosophical insights that may come from knowledge of actual different natural languages. Worryingly, and I, and I conclude here, the discipline that is perhaps closest in its practice to contemporary philosophy is the law. Consider, for instance, this quote, which um, I'm indebted to um, uh, Enrico Terrone for. So Richard Rorty, uh, in uh, I think it's a book or a paper in 1982, um, he says, quote, in the course of the transition to post-positivistic analytic philosophy, the image of the scientist has been replaced by another. Though it is not quite clear what, perhaps the most appropriate model for the analytic philosopher is now the lawyer rather than either the scholar or the scientist. The ability to construct a good brief or conduct devastating cross-examination or find relevant precedents is pretty much the ability which analytic philosophers think of as distinctively philosophical, end quote. And indeed, the law is a discipline in which a native grasp of the language of litigation seems to be very useful. Very good lawyer is often someone who can persuade judges or jurors in court. And so an effortless and masterful grasp of the language and culture of their audience is an almost necessary skill for them. However, if the contemporary philosopher is best characterized as a lawyer, the tension with the Socratic ideal becomes very stark indeed. For as we saw at the beginning, Socrates portrayed by Plato is mainly concerned with the substance of his speech as opposed to its form. Indeed, Socrates' main antagonists are presented as the sophists who would trade their oratorical skills for use in the course of law and in politics. And I think contemporary philosophers that philosophy then cannot abandon itself to the opposite of the Socratic ideal without radically altering its nature. And so in contrast to current situation, I my hope is to see a world where many more philosophers study and work in different countries from the native one, sharing their peculiar cultural and linguistic perspectives with those of the new home countries. Thank you very much.